Well, Michael, Shannon, thank you for joining myself and George on uh, the Friday Club. Um, just for those people who might not be aware, you are, of course, the son of legendary footballer and trainer now, uh, Mick Shannon. But you're a man of many talents, um, not least a well-renowned author, amongst other things. But Mick, let's start off with, up until two years ago, you were your dad's assistant trainer, you were you were, you were well-loved and a, a famous face on the race courses, normally holding court in the owners and trainers bar, regaling your stories. Then all of a sudden, you just disappeared off the face of the planet. Where have you been, Mick? Well, George did a similar thing, um, but for slightly different reasons. Um, I've been in Australia, Martin. Lovely to see you, George, by the way. George being on is the only reason I actually came on, to be honest, mate. But um, that's cruel, isn't it? Um, that's a very kind introduction, Martin. How are you, more than importantly? Because this is the first time we've been together for how long? It's been a couple of years. I'm good. As, as you've seen, I'm struggling to cope with technology as normal, but managed to get this Zoom call up and running. So we just want to find out. We've missed, me and George have missed you. The, the race and fraternity have, have missed you. You just suddenly disappeared. So you went off to Australia. What was all that about? Um, do you want to know the real reasons or do you want to know um, the fluffy bunny reasons <clears throat> to kick straight off the bat? A bit of both, maybe. Well, it's things happen in life. I mean, the weirdest thing is the same day that George had his fall in, uh, well, no, the same day that George won the ledger, um, it's a weird thing that I always connect George with my life. And uh, when George won the ledger on September the 10th, 2016 um i was at chester having a great time and a very close friend of mine i lost her to suicide and it's the weird thing is that um i lost the plot and uh, and then george a few months later when i was really struggling he had his fall and um i basically thought what am i going to do with my life because i was like did you really want to start it this way around martin <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wasn't expecting. I wasn't expecting this, but come on, no. let's, let, let's keep going. It's, well, it's, it's, it's I basically. I basically had to put my life back together again because I wasn't any good at my job anymore. Um, some would say I wasn't anyway. So I just basically got myself together and said, right, what what's the best thing I can do? And rather than being, you know, under stress of as a trainer's job or being traveling fifty thousand miles a year around the country, I thought, what's the best thing I can do for me? So I said, right, I'm going to tear it all up, send four emails after five beers one evening when I basically didn't know what to do to four trainers, to trainers I knew in Australia but didn't know, if you know what I mean. I just emailed them and said, can I have a job? And I promised myself there and then that night that the first trainer that said or came back to me would be the where, where my life would go. So basically... I stripped it all back and became a stable lad in Australia. So it was a bit, a bit of escapism, would you say? You kind of rolled the dice and just and just went with it. A, a brave move. Well, it's, it's you probably I've probably completely scuppered your um your thought of having witty banter on this <laughs> chat, mate. But, um, <laughs> you, you reach a stage in life where you got to be honest about who you are, what you're doing. Um, you know, George, for example, his life was turned upside down. Mine was for different reasons. But um, I just basically said, right, Michael, you've got to get your life together and it ain't going to happen doing the same old familiar things that you're not enjoying doing anymore. So I just literally said at 44 years of age, get on a plane, go somewhere where you don't know anyone. Or you don't know what you're doing. Um, you don't know where you're going and take yourself out of your comfort zone and find out who you really are. So that's what I did. And I'll be honest with you. It's the best thing I did with my life. I mean, I'm a different person now. I mean, the sadness lives on in all of us, whoever's lost anyone. But um, the best thing I ever did was go away and actually strip me, strip myself down to the bare bones, find out exactly what I want to do, find out exactly who I am. And here I am now, back in exactly the same place. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Australia again in a minute. But George, you must be able to sort of relate to that, what, what, what Mick's kind of changed his life, because you, you obviously... After your fall, you've gone through a life-changing set of circumstances. So yeah, you must be able to understand where he's coming from. Well, I think, um, obviously, I've been good friends with Mick. And I don't know how it really came around, our friendship. It probably is uh, all of us. I know, it was in the railway tavern, mate. 
yeah, the railway tavern was a good starting point. But um, I think sometimes you need to step away and get a bit of a try and find yourself a bit. And I've had that in, in, in my sort of recovery. And I know speaking to Junior a little bit, it was a well, Michael. It was um, it was kind of finding yourself and stepping away from and 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 sort of reinventing yourself as such. And, and we've both done it. And it's good to have the real Michael Shannon back in the the pro, well, the, my, my favourite Michael Shannon in the world back. You're my favourite George Baker in the world. Apologies <laughs> to the trainer. I do love the man, but yeah. No, it's good um, to have you back. Good. And um, I think, you know, when you went to Australia, you, it was like starting from scratch again, wasn't it? Looking after horses and you really mucked in. Well, I, I was a stable lad. That's all I wanted to do because I, I, I'm here at Norman Court Stud now. And um, that was where I stepped away from being an assistant trainer, putting up with phone calls, travelling being put under the scrutiny, as you lads as jockeys would know. Um, and, you know, everyone's got stress at every level. You're, you're, you're 10 box yards, you know, you're 40, 50 yards, you know, the, the, the bottom, middle and the top of all competitive sports are stressful. But you know, lads, I mean, we all know the stress that you're under. And to be honest with you, I didn't cope with it great to start with. But after what happens to my friend, I just thought, Crikey, we think in, in this tiny little goldfish bowl of racing, why, why, why am I like this? Why am I, I thought, sod it. You know, I've, I travel the world of watching in the ashes, for example. I love Australia. And I thought, well, I ain't got a lot to go on with my life now. I'm not enjoying what I'm doing. Let's strip it back, as I say, and go and, you know, obviously it was different for you, for you and Nicola, George, but, you know, it was a question of, right, you know, I can sulk and be crying all the time and just drink myself into oblivion or find a different purpose and find out who you are, really. It sounds like a bit of a hippie mentality, but it's the best thing that, it's the worst thing and the best thing that's ever happened to me. And it's such a, it's, I mean, I've, I've written a book about the whole experience, whether or not that's ever wanted is a different kettle of fish. And there's a few, obviously there's, there's a few feelings I've got to take into consideration um, with family and that, because I've written one book, which was totally honest. Everyone was on board with it. But when you go into mental health issues and stuff like that, you've got to take into account those that are left behind. I wrote it from someone who was one of them people left behind. But there are brothers and mothers and fathers and grandparents from someone dying at the age of 30, 37 who were left behind. So, And because of that, I had to get away. I had to go away, work out what I was doing <clears throat> and make a fool of myself for three months, essentially. And then as soon as I got through the, as soon as someone started to take the mickey out of me, and as soon as the banter started in the stable, I was flying. I was, it was where I should have been. And it's basically, it's my whole life now. Get up in the morning, muck out horses, have a crack, take the piss remorselessly, and come home tired. I think that's great for anyone who's struggling in it. And which is also the great thing about being in racing. I'm not saying everyone feels the same way, but the whole lockdown process for me in racing in Australia back in March, you've got to get up. Horses aren't get on on cars. You can lock up in the garage on Christmas day, as we all know. So we were, although there was lockdowns, we were grafting all the time. And that, you know, that I think it's been very easy from my own personal point of view through this, this very weird year. And as I say, I've worked out that as long as I'm grafting, I'm glowing in the dark now because I've been running tonight simply because um, lockdown ends and the West Tiddly Pigeons have got an important cut, that cut game on Sunday morning. Um, things like that have just got me back in the game and, and it's made me smile so much more now. And to be honest with you, lads, we're on, we're talking together. It's like friends reunited on it. <laughs> so Mickey, you, you obviously needed to get away and, You've talked about the stresses and the life in the racing bubble. You were going racing every day. You were your dad's. You were front of house when you were dealing with the owners, the disappointments when horses don't run as well. So that pressure obviously got on top of you. So when you went to Australia, you were literally, without any disrespect, you were a stable lad again. Was that part of the process for you, just not having the responsibility or the pressure? Yeah, absolutely. Just get out and just go... And by then it didn't matter. By then, when someone, when you, when you go to a funeral and you, you, you put and you think, and you don't know any, the thing with suicide is you don't know any answers. You only imagine the answers in your mind. 
So it was just literally, I'm out of it because I couldn't help myself. I couldn't help other people. And everyone tried to help. Everyone tries to say the right things. And, uh, mm. and I, I, but I, they were saying the things I'd say to them. I was aware. It wasn't like I was a complete, you know, I've got the sort of intelligence to realize what people are trying to say to me. And I knew it too. And it was like, you know, and we've seen mental health come up again and again and again. And it's never really touched me until that moment. So going to being a stable lad and meeting and becoming an immigrant and becoming an outsider and, beca- you know, and and if I wanted a brew at eight o'clock, you know, I mean, we started at three in the morning. If I wanted a brew, you can't have a brew. You're, you're grafting. You've got to put this horse, horse on the wall, hose that horse down. You know, you've got to get on the box. You've got to take that to a trial over there. You know, this, that, and... And it was a great thing for me. It stripped me back and it really, you know, it, it, it grounded me again in terms of, and the friends I met, Martin, it was like the railway tavern days. It was literally like Hungerford during the time when you won the Derby and George was basically, George and Chris Catlin were on the all weather all winter. And just the days we had there, were just, it was like that. It was like I was, I mean, not a single one of my colleagues that I worked with in Barnes 1 and 2 at Chris Waller's yard in Rose Hill not one of them were born before Back to the Future was made. And they, <laughs> they called me granddad. I mean, and like the last thing I knew, when I turned around, I was 27. Now I'm like 46 and it was like I was granddad in the barn. Are you going to come back into racing once lockdown is over? Are you going to come back into the racing? Are you going to come racing? Are we going to see you? you we can't, you can't be... <laughs> The last time I went racing in England, I saw George, and because no one had seen me on a racetrack for two, for 18 months, I had about 75 pints of Guinness at Newbury. Um, and uh, George, bless him, he's obviously sensible George now, rather than rubbish George, just watched me consume about 15 of them, and someone put me in a cab and sent me home. Um, I don't know. It's a tough one, Martin. I think to be a trainer now, you need to be rich trainer. You need to have... You need to have as much dough as the owners. It's getting so competitive. And having been to Australia, have I not mentioned that? The only reason I'm fascinated with you two is you rode classic winners. All I did was lead up the winner of the richest turf race in the world in Yes, Yes, Yes for Cornwall. (laughs) (laughs) I did throw that one in there. Uh, But the buzz I got off of that, I felt like, and that it was a massive, huge team effort. The whole, the whole point that I worry about these days in English, in British racing, is uh, I don't see where the prize money is, because when I once I got the bonuses, and obviously Waller's a monster, he's like the John Gosden of or the Aidan O'Brien in Australia. I I was on as much money as a stable lad down there as I was as an assistant to me dad here. Really, you know, the prize money, mate. The pool money, or you know, we call it, you know. You get 1.5% as a stable lad out there. We call it pool money mm. here. Frightening. Absolutely frightening. So, Mick, okay, so listen, you've travelled the world. You've, you, you're assistant trainer for 15 years or more. You've done a, You've seen a lot come and go in this sport. What is next for Mick Shannon? I don't think anyone cares, do they? Yeah, I care. And the public <laughs> cares. Yeah, the anyone wants- world cares. I don't know. I'm literally buzzing. I've just been made captain of West Hillsley Cricket Club. I come on for 20 minutes on a Sunday afternoon in the winters for West Titherley Pilgit, but, uh, Pigeons down in the village, just 50 yards away from me here. Um, I'm incredibly happy. I love my horses. I love the family business in terms of the breeding side. I mean, as I say, training's an easy job. If you've got horses, you can train. But it's getting the people on side. It's getting the horses on the side. He's getting the jockey. He's getting the only way I'd ever train. Put it this way: is if I had George Baker as my assistant. And I thought that. That's not even. I thought that when we were in the tavern, when George was telling me I could never be a trainer, and I, that's complete honesty. How do you respond to that, George? I tell you, I respond to that. I'll do it if we can have Martin Dwyer as stable jockey. That's the reason not. I won't do it. <laughs> I can. I, I, if this goes out, this section, I think owners will just be absolutely frightened to death at that prospect. 